want to welcome to 11:30 Wednesday Bible study, a luncheon Bible study here at Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. I want to thank you for coming our way with us on this Wednesday. Right now, we're in a series of lessons on spiritual gifts, really important for the church. You need to read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, uh, where Paul talks about them in 1 Corinthians. You could read about it in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. These are the three major passages on the listing of spiritual gifts. And so we're, we, have, we have gone, progressed. Uh, we have studied 12. We expect you to study uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, where it talks about the spiritual uh, gifts make up the nomenclature of the body of Christ, the church. The gifts make up the identity of the ministries of the church, of every church, the Christian church. And so you need to read that. Now, the gifts, we, have, we are after the gifts in that, and so we've looked at them in first, last time, we looked at 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 9, and 10, which is very important because today we're going to look at spiritual gifts out of chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 9, and 10. And the next time we'll look in the 14th chapter on spiritual gifts. Uh, now, here's what I, I want you to recall. I want you to... In my introduction, we're going to have a word of prayer. But look at 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 9, and 10, where Paul lists nine gifts. In verse 8, he lists, and if you recall from last time, he listed them, he listed nine gifts, but he broke them into the three groupings. That's last week. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the Spirit. There's a mende sequence. And he breaks it right here with the word heteros without the day, D-E. And so here is the second group. To another faith by the same Holy Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguished uh, spirits. And then there's a break, another break in the Mende sequence. One, two, three, four, five. Now he lists, uh, but he puts them in three groups by breaking, by taking the day out, the D-E, and, and he puts heteros in in the beginning of two of the groups. So he uses the word heteros again, uh, and to another, another of a different kind. So you really can't see that. But like in verse 9, when it says to another faith, that's heteros, that's not alas. All the other times it's alas, 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 and this time it's heteros. And he comes back and does it again. He leaves off the day, which means we have a break, and he, and he uses, doesn't use alas, he uses heteros, one of a different kind. And he says to, uh, and, and to another, and to another various, and to another of different, various kinds of tongues, different various, various kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. So what he did is he broke them into three groups. And we talked about that in great detail last week. Uh, if you have a study guide, and you, you can get it later, I'm sure, as you go to our website. I broke them down again because that's really important. He, broke, he put them in three groups. In the first group, in verse um, 8, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge, that's two gifts. In, in section 2, which is verse 9 and part of 10, with no day and heteros, he puts, he puts five gifts. There are five gifts lifted, listed in nine and part of ten. In verse ten, the last half of verse ten, there is no day. He breaks the sequence, and he uses heteros with different kinds of tongues, 
and interpretation. That's two gifts. So that's nine gifts in three groups. Now, that's really important because Paul, Paul did is he, he did that so when he gets to in the Greek language, so that when he gets to the 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 9, and 10, he's going to, re, he's going to, he's going to pull one gift out of each section. and tell you something very interesting about him. He's going to pull one out of a section, and that's going to be really important to what he's going to tell you in chapter 13. So here we are in chapter 13, verses 8, 9, and 10. And this is what my study is on today. He begins in verse 8. He closes out a section on love never fails. He's been talking about love uh, in regard to spiritual gifts and how they operate in the church. And then he comes back to gifts. He's not talking about love as a gift. It, it is a gift of God, but it's, it's not a spiritual gift. Love never fails. Then he goes, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. Verse 9, for we know in part, he just talked about knowledge, and we prophesy in part, he just talked about prophecy, but when the perfect comes, the partial, we know in part and we prophesy in part, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Now, I'm going to explain all that to you today. I'm going to explain all that to you today. All right? So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in the Christian life, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. How do I get out of carnality and back to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality? How do I do that? First hmm? John 1 9. If we confess our sins, if we come into an agreement with God on what is sin by the Bible's terms, the Bible tells you what sin is, not people, Bible. When I confess my sin, I come into an agreement, homo legeo, I come into an agreement with God that I've committed a sin. It could be mental attitude types of sin. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue. The sins of the tongue. My confession is coming into agreement with God that the Bible has called what I'm confessing sin, and I'm confessing it to get out of carnality because I've chose to walk in the flesh and not the spirit. I've chose to walk by sight, not by faith. When I confess it, when I confess my sin, it, he says, here's his promise, I, I am just and faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That cleansing goes back to verse 7. It takes you back to the cross as a believer to the cross of Jesus Christ where his blood takes care of sin, this time in the Christian life. Because I have sinned, I'm in carnality. I haven't lost my salvation. I've lost the power of my sanctification. I've chose as a believer to walk in the flesh. To get out of that, I've got to confess it, come into agreement with what, the, what God calls in the Bible sin. I confess that. The blood of Christ works continuously in my life in regard to sin, this time personal sin, not Adamic sin. And I'm restored to sanctification, to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in my life. So let's do that. Let's take, let's take a moment. You confess your sins. Pray to God that he would teach you something miraculous today about the subject of temporary spiritual gifts. Because he mentioned that some gifts are going to be done away with. Some gifts are going to cease during the church age. 
Spiritual gifts are for the church. Age. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us through the internet the word of God. I pray today, Father, once again, the people would allow the Holy Spirit to teach them the truth. We seek the truth, Father. We seek the truth. Why? Because Jesus said in John 8, 32, the truth will set you free from the cosmic lies about spiritual gifts. So, Father, encourage our hearts today to pay attention. Let the Holy Spirit teach us out of 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 9, and 10 in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul set us up wonderfully in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 9, and 10 in the Greek language. I, I probably should mention to you that my Greek, all my Greek study comes out of the Nessel Greek text because I use the NAS translation of the Bible. All of my studies come out of the Nessel's Greek text. So if you wonder about, you know, what text I'm using, that's, that's my text. Now, and so I, I rely on that as I go in and I look at the Greek language out of 1 Corinthians 12 and then 13 and, and later on 14. I, that's, that's very important to my life and my studies. Today, what we find with certain gifts going to be done away with and certain gifts are going to cease during the church age because they're, they're gifts for the church. These are gifted ministries in the church, the body of Christ. So during the church age, some of these gifts are going to be done away with and some are going to cease. And that's, and that's why we call, we call this study temporary spiritual gifts. So I want to talk about five things today. I want to talk about five things. The first thing is, once again, you will see that Paul's mastery of the Greek grammar, as he builds upon the grammar, his doctrine. Chapter 12 goes to 13, 13 goes to 14. You just have to understand how Paul teaches out of the Greek language. It's really a masterpiece of the Greek language. Sometimes you can't see it in the English, like you can't see the Mende sequence. It's there, and once it's pointed out, you probably could see it. But you don't realize that when a day is, when a sequence is broke and is done twice, then you have three groups. I mean, that's some of the things that it takes. This is not deep Greek, but it does require some study. Now, I want you to go back and look at 1 Corinthians 13, 8 with me. He says, but if there are gifts of prophecy, see, see I don't know if your Bible has the words, they, there are, what it says, but if there are gifts, note it. Well, you don't have my paper, but you see, they're not there in the original text. They were added in the English just because you do that with foreign languages to try to make it sensible in the English. Actually, what the Greek language says in verse 8, it says, but if prophecy, but if prophecy and it's talking about gifts, but prophecy is plural. And so they add, there are gifts, because that's assumed, chapter 12 to chapter 13. But there are gifts are in italics. The, but the, the word prophecy is plural in the Greek language. So in the English, they add that in there for you to make smooth translation. There are there are gifts of prophecy. There are prophecies. There are gifts of prophecies. There are gifts of prophecy, okay? In the second one, if there are, there are is not there, tongues, they will cease. 
See, he, he, he says, here's the gift of prophecy. Here's prophecy. It will be done away with. He's talking about gifts. Tw chapter 12, 13, and 14, that's what it's about. Trying to clear up trying to clear up problems of understanding how spiritual gifts come, work, and etc. Tongues, they will what? Cease. If there are, there's no words there are, then he goes, but if tongues, it's plural, they will cease. Then he says, if there is knowledge, there is no, there is, he says, and if knowledge, it will, it will be done away with. So here's what we know. In verse 8, we are told that, that the gift of prophecy, the gift of prophecies, prophecy, will be done away with, tongues will cease, and knowledge will be done away with, the gift of knowledge will be done away with, during the church age, because spiritual gifts are for the church. Well, you, look, you got to read 1 Corinthians 12, especially verses 12 through 27, where he teaches that. That whole passage is about, and I told you last week, please study chapter 12, because 13 comes off from 12, and you've got to study 13 because... 14 comes off of 13. That's <laughs> what we call Bible study. You actually got to study your Bible. Okay? And, and I know, I, yeah, I hope you do. All right? Now, here's what's interesting. The word if. See, if, if, if. It's used three times. If. And in the Greek language, it's spelled E-I-T-E. -E. It's called a disjunctive. It has the first class condition along with this conjunction. And so it's called a disjunction. It should be translated weather. W-H-E, you know, weather. Not weather like it's bad weather, but whether you should do this or not. Weather, okay? <laughs> and when the writer does that, it's to emphasize, it's to put a spotlight on the gift and then flash that spotlight over to something important that's going to happen. So when he does, and all three of these ifs got it. So when he says, if prophecy... The light hits prophecy, and then pff, it switches right over. It will be done away. Then tongues. Spotlight hits tongues as the gift. And then it, the light take, moves from the idea of tongues, boom, right there, onto it will cease. He does it a third time with knowledge. Knowledge. There's the spotlight. The spotlight is taken off knowledge and put over there, be done away with. Isn't that marvelous? E I T E. If there is prophecy and there is such a gift, if there is tongues and there such is a gift, if there is knowledge and there certainly is a gift, I just listed them, Paul says, in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 9, and 10. Now, let me tell you something interesting about him. In chapter 13, Paul says. And what he did was he pulled one out of each of the three groups. And he said, there are some gifts that are temporary in the church age. Sometime between Pentecost, Acts 2, and the rapture of the church, spiritual gifts are operating. During that period, some gifts 
are going to be temporary. Some are going to be done away with, and some are going to cease. And he tells you. And how he tells you, he pulls one out of each of the three groups out of 1 Corinthians 12. <laughs> well, all I can do is read the Bible to you and tell you what it says. I got three gifts. I got prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. When you go back to chapter 12, verse 8, there's one set of gifts called the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. He pulled knowledge out. In section 2, we have a different faith. We have gifts of healing, effects of miracles, prophecy, and discerning spirits. He pulled out prophecy. In section 3, we have various kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. He pulled out one. Please tell me you see that. I, I, I have no idea why you've never heard this before. It's been, it's been written since the first century, canonized in the Word of God. I mean, I, 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 I can't. You know, people ask me all the time, well, where did you ever get? And unless they ask me questions like, how do you know that E, how do you know that E-I is E-I-T-E? -E? Well, I got, got the Greek language. Well, how do you know what it means? Because I, listen, I have, I have, Dana, I have, I have Dana and Manchi as my, my Greek books. I mean, I looked it up. I looked it up. I, does, I do my research on page 220. Researched it. I mean, I studied the Bible by, by the Greek language, and I pull out all my tools, all my grammar tools. Yes. That's why I'm a teacher. I mean, you know, if you don't, if you never heard this before, because you haven't sat under a teacher, a, t a teacher that understands the importance of the languages for you to understand what the Bible is teaching. I mean, I do it. Listen, at Pentecost, we've, we've talked about this, but at Pentecost, they were given 19 gifts. You remember that? I taught it. Listen. Go back. You're going to have to go back and, and, and listen to some of my, my messages. I think this is like my fourth lesson. I mean, I've been building like Paul has been building. I've been following his lead as he has begun to build this, this doctrinal uh, thesis. Okay? And he says, that was at Pentecost, he says, before we get to the rapture of the church, some of these gifts are going to be done away with, and some are going to cease, right? Wow. Listen to me again. Somewhere you got to write this down and, and do that. You've got to read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. You, come on, you got to study. Well, point number two. Paul is declaring a doctrinal concept about temporary gifts in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10 by telling us that some would be done away with during the church age and some would cease. And he tells you which ones by putting them in three groups in chapter 12 and pulling one out of the group to tell you that these nine are temporary gifts. because he doesn't want to go have, back and list them all again. He pulls one out from each group to tell you that those are nine temporary gifts. Now, let me tell you something else. 
Now, you got you to listen. You've really got to pay attention to me. See the word done away? It's used twice. It's used in verse 8. Done away. And in a verse 10. Verse 10, say. We, in verse 8, in verse 8, we have done away, cease, and done away. In verse 8, we're told some gifts are going to be done away with. And listen to me. The first one comes out of section 1 in verse 12, in chapter 12, section 1. And the last, in verse 8, and the last one comes out of the third group. Uh, look, in, the first, in section one, we have the word of wisdom, word of knowledge. He pulls the word of knowledge out. In section two, we have faith, gifts of healing, uh, if miracles, prophecy. He pulls out prophecy. And then tongues. You see, he pulls out tongues. Now, what he did, does in chapter, in chapter 13, verse 8, he, he pulls out prophecy Prophecy came out of number three. No, it comes out of, prophecy comes out of section two, right? Prophecy comes out of section two. Tongues comes out of section three. And knowledge comes out of section one. See, he just reaches out and pulls one out of each of the three sections to show you temporary gifts. Some of these temporary gifts are going to be done away with, and some are going to cease. All right? Now, let me tell you something about the word done away with first. It's spelled K-A-T-A, -A, kata. That's a prepositional phrase. And argeo, kata argeo. It's used as a, as a future passive indicative, and it's a transitive verb. A transitive verb needs an object, a direct object, needs a direct object, needs an object outside itself to complete it. Done away. It's a transitive verb. Something outside of the gift that's related to the gift, knowledge, and prophecy, right? Th those two, that done away, the pu that's pulled out of these groups, two groups. Now you have to understand that. That's a transitive verb. I mean, you know that in English. This is a transitive verb, not just Greek. This is a transitive verb. It's a transitive verb. It's identified as a future passive indicative and is going to require something outside of itself to complete it, done away. It's going to complete it. Note that done away is used twice in our text with two different categories, sections of spiritual gifts. Something outside. Something outside of prophecy is going to fulfill it. Something outside of knowledge is going to fulfill it. What, what is going to fulfill it is related to it. Now let's talk about the other one, cease. Cease is an intransitive verb. It's spelled P-A-U-O. It's a future with an indirect middle indicative. And I can't tell you how important it is, so I'm going to explain to you. When Paul put that in an indirect middle voice, a tense, a voice and a mood. When he put it in the indirect middle it intensified it. It put the spotlight on it. 
And what it means, an intransitive verb, means that something inside it is going to cause itself to cease. It's an intransitive, not an out, out. A transitive is looking for something outside it to complete it. Intransitive is looking in, internally for something that is involved in it is going to cause it to cease. And it's related to the group of tongue group. When we, when we put them in section 1, 2, and 3 out of 1 Corinthians, tongues was in section 3. Section 1 and 2, and then 3. I want... <laughs> Done away is a transitive verb. Cease is an intransitive verb. You say, Ron, where do you get this stuff? Greek grammar. Dana. Page 159. To help you. <laughs> Point number three. Paul referred to spiritual gifts that would be done away during the church age as partial Done away, partial. He's connected these ideas. The gifts that are going to be done away are partial. Something outside of them is, they're a part of something bigger outside of them. This is a part of this over here. That's a piece of pie. Where's the whole pie? Here it is. Boy, I can't tell you how important this stuff is. This is found in verse 9. For we know in part, that's a gift. We know in part, that's knowledge. Now, in part is really interesting. It's ek. It's ek plus the genitive with meros, M-E-R-O-S. We know in part... That's a partial. We know in part, he used a prepositional phrase. We know in part, in part, we know in part, we know in part. We only know in part until, it's, until we get the complete knowledge. And it's going to happen during the church age. <laughs> Isn't it fun? Isn't learning fun? Isn't learning fun? It is to me. I love this stuff. We know in part, and we prophesy in part. Prophecy is partial, waiting on something outside to complete it, to complete the prophet prophecy. <laughs> Aren't you interested in what that's going to be? Are you not interested? What is that during the church age that's going to happen? Well, here's the answer. <laughs> when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Remember, there are two out of the three, out of the three sections, one, two, and three, two of these sections that amount to seven gifts will be done away with. And he pull, the ones he's pulling out are the ones that the Corinthian church is having trouble with. They're having trouble with knowledge because of the culture of Gnosticism. They're having trouble with prophecy because of the Jews in their congregation. And they're having problems with tongues just because they're misusing it. And he says, well, let me tell you something. Some of these gifts that I listed in 12, and now he explains in 13, going to be done away with. 
by something outside themselves, and tongues is going to cease by something inside itself being done. When something is done because of the purpose of tongues, when the purpose of tongues is completed, from within itself it's going to cease. <laughs> oh, I know. I've just, I have just, I have just really created issues for you right now, haven't I? I didn't write it. And I've told you exactly how it's written in the language. Now, when he uses the word when, he uses the conjunction hotan, H-O-T-A-N. And the word come, erkoomai, is an aorist active subjunctive. Hoten goes with that subjunctive. And they're time oriented to events. Hoten says, in the perfect timing of God in the church age. When the perfect comes, he will fulfill the partial gifts. Section 1 and 2. When the perfect comes, it will come in God's timing. During the church age, gifts are for the church. My, 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 my. Read, read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. Read Romans, the 12th chapter. My, 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 people. My, my, my. Well, the perfect. Let's go back to the perfect. It's got the definite article, T-O, and teleon. T-E-L-E-I-O-N. Now, don't get crazy with me. In the Greek language, when it ends in an O-N, it could be masculine, accusative masculine, or it could be nominative neuter. This is where a lot of people make a mistake. Now, let's just look at this. When the perfect comes, let's just take English. When the perfect comes, what's the subject? What's the subject? The perfect. When the perfect comes. That's the subject. That means that's nominative. It's nominative, singular, neuter. It's not the accusative. It's not an accusative. It's a nominative. If it's nominative in the Greek language, it's nominative singular neuter. When the perfect, in God's perfect time and during the church age at some point, God's in charge of that, like the rapture. When the perfect comes, The word teleon. <laughs> teleon comes from teleos, or what we call teleology as a subject in our church. It's a theological study in our school of biblical theology. And it means to complete or come to an end or reach its goal or purpose. Teleon, having attained the end or purpose when the perfect comes, it will absorb all the partials. It will incorporate them into one. And it's neuter. It's not a person. It's a thing. When the perfect comes, the partial, now watch this. It, the, the, this fr it's a phrase. The whole thing is a phrase. The partial has the definite article T-O with the prepositional phrase ek, meros, which means partial.
the T-O is placed in this prepositional phrase, in front of this prepositional phrase is the definite article T-O, which comes from the word the perfect. T-O teleon, T-O teleon. What Paul did is he took the definite article, stuck it over here on the backside of this sentence, to emphasize a great point. I did it for you. Here is the partial, the lights on the partial. Boom, it will be done away with. The partial gift, the spotlights on it, you know, knowledge, prophecy. Then the spotlight went to done away with. Now the spotlight goes, is put on the perfect, when the perfect comes, they'll be done away. See what he did? The perfect, the perfect will do away with them. The partial with the T-O, the perfect, the perfect, the perfect comes, the partial puts the T-O on front of it to make sure you understand the perfect is the one that's going to do away with it. The partial will be, then when the perfect comes, the partial, and the, this, is a, this is section one and section two, will be done away during the church age. That's how important the perfect is. What, listen, let's just stop for a What in the world could possibly, could the perfect be that could complete, could bring the partial knowledge of, of the partial gift, the the gift of knowledge that works partial into completion. What, what could be the partial of prophecy that would bring it in, into a completion? It is the canonization of the word of God. Now, let, let's talk about a few things. I got four important points under point three. A, B, C, D, E. The partial spiritual gifts are part of the perfect. They're a part of the perfect. When the perfect comes, it will incorporate them. This will be out and that will be in. That's why there, there were, in the original giving of gifts, there, you could have had more than one gift. You could, you could be multi-gift, like Paul. The partial spiritual gifts are part of the perfect, the totalion, neuter. The partial will be completed in the perfect. The partial spiritual gifts do not coexist. Did you notice that? The partial does not coexist with the perfect. It started, but when the perfect comes into church history, it will absorb these. They will be part of being able to bring the fulfilling of the perfect. They will be essential in preparing the timing for the perfect to come. My, this is so good. I can't believe it. You're not getting this. You're going to have to list this a couple of times. That's why we got it on the internet. You see, they don't coexist. You got the partial, you don't have the perfect. You have the perfect, you have the partial because they've now been incorporated. The perfect is not a person, it's a thing. It's in the neuter. Remember, it's the subject, it's nominative. Also, the perfect is the outside thing of, a tra of the transitive verb. It is the outside thing of the transitive verb that is necessary to complete the partial spiritual gift in the church. Now, let me conclude in point four. Are you getting all this? Well, you have to hear it a few times, I, I, I suppose. 
The two spiritual gifts that are pulled out, one is knowledge and one is prophecy. That's section one and section two. Two spiritual gifts were listed by Paul as partial that will be done away with by the coming of the perfect. When you look back at our three sections, you can see the section one and section two, what the gifts are that's been listed that will be done away with. Therefore, the nine spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, and 10 are now considered in 13, 8, 9, and 10 as temporary. Seven spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 will be done away with, and two will cease. The, the, the ones that will be done away with will be because of the perfect will bring them, will incorporate them. Our focus in this lesson was to discuss the seven spiritual gifts that will be done away with by the coming of the perfect. It's neuter, not masculine. Next week, we will study the other two spiritual gifts that would cease and what that means by something with inside themselves that's fulfilling. Let me conclude at point number five. I believe the neuter of the perfect thing, totelion, nominative singular neuter, that was going to come to incorporate the partial spiritual gifts is the canonization of the scriptures, which we call the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. The perfect must be something that incorporates the seven partial gifts and completes them for the intended purpose of the church on earth. Remember that spiritual gifts are, are for the body of Christ, the church, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. Here's what I believe, James 1, 25. The one who looks intently at the perfect totelion, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, what are we talking about? We're talking about the word of God operating under the faith cycle. This man will be blessed in what he does, divine production. I'm not the only one that thinks this. There are a lot of scholars like Vines and other men like that that believe that. So you ought to read James 1, 22 through 25, compared to Romans 12, 2, and 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. That's a whole lot, wasn't it? <laughs> and I know. It just depends on whether you're willing to accept it as the truth. All I can do is teach it. I can't make you believe it. It's not my job to make you believe it. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. If you're a spiritual person, you will come to the truth. Therefore, I try to present it as well as I can for you to fact find it, explore it, discover it, and accept it. Are there false teachings? Yes, there was in days, in Paul's day. That's why he taught it the way he taught it and why I taught it the way I'm teaching it so that you could get it. I want you to be set free in the grace of God. To know what the Bible says and be confident about it. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. Everywhere Paul went, he turned the world right side up. The world thought he was turning them upside down, but <laughs> oh, Father, you're wonderful. And we're so thankful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that reveals truth from the Word of God. 
You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Indeed, that is true. We've tried to lay it out, Father, as the best we know how so that it can be researched and studied by men of the word, that they might be men of the word. Let the word dictate the truth, not other men. May we be like Paul. I came to you, not only in word, but in power and the Holy Spirit and full conviction. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.